everyone and welcome we are back uh, this week so we had a small break last week we are here with the, uh, the usual suspects Felix and Jakub and you are listening to a two and a half <coughs> gamers podcast we're discussing the latest news fun stuff and dropping some knowledge at the end so um, you know stay with us uh, hey guys uh, how are you it's been a while hello, since we talked been a while it, it felt weird yeah one yeah, week without you guys i didn't feel complete yeah, a lot of stuff happening in the world actually <laughs> this time really <laughs> not, not like much ac- activis- uh, acquisitions but lots of lots of you know stuff's moving around just today i, I read that google paused the billing uh, store thing in russia yeah really? well that happened also for apple and, and everything else so you know that's uh, how it's gonna look like in the very near future Sad times. Yeah, but let's not go there. Nope. Let's not go there. Uh, yeah, we are discussing the latest news, I think. Well, the news that you already heard, but, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, hear our take as well. And then, if you remember, we had this, like, Q&A about user acquisition, and then we teased there is going to be a Q&A about the game design. So this is the game design session. I'm very much looking forward. It's going to be so, <laughs> so much fun. And I'm going to look like absolutely stupid idiot. That's f- that's for sure. That's for sure. Get in line. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> okay, let's start. Let's start with the news. So there's the the Netflix bought Next Games for 65 mil. I mean, you already heard about it. From what I I see, it's just uh, <laughs> it's a very funny move. I mean, it makes sense because Next Games started to produce the Stranger Things game. But, uh, well, the Next Games uh, as a company, I mean, I'm not sure like if they had a, a lot of success, honestly. They had the, the, zomb- um, what was the, the zombie game. What is it? A Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah Walking yeah. Dead. But it was a, a, a geolocation game, AR <laughs> as well. But they got a bit <laughs> screwed on that title because there's like IP rights both to the Walking Dead, like, TV show from AMC, but also the cartoon. So then, like, someone else was making a Walking Dead game that was, you know, from the cartoon IP. And, yeah, they got a bit screwed over on that. Okay, yeah, I think this move is kind of expected when the studio is mostly based on IP-based uh, games. So it, it makes sense for... like uh, It seems like an aqua hire, to be honest, yeah. where Netflix want to push into games. They already, as Mate said, they already did their latest title, which is pretty much... A kind of similar game to Empires and Puzzles just like the with the Stranger thing, Things just IP. Just with the Stranger Things IP. Yeah, that's yeah which, to be honest, is for me a little bit of a product mismatch because Empires why, and Puzzles... Why, why is, would you think so? Empires and Puzzles is a mid-core RPG where the Stranger Things, uh, you really need to dig deep to come up with the same uh, unit pool into that extent that like you're pretty much pushing, if I understand, you, you end up with the situation that there's like multiple instances of characters in the pool, like you know, the guy from left, the guy from right, the guy in epic <laughs> version and mythic version, but it's the same guy because you run out of stuff to put in yeah, the unit Yeah, okay, pool. I know, I, okay, I know. <laughs> what uh, you I see know. what you mean. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, what do we? What do we think of the price? Like 65 million in cash, no shares, two euros a share? Yeah, that, that seems to me like an aqua hire. <laughs> I can't believe we're saying aqua hire well, when it's like 60 million acquisition. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know, like I'm, I'm guessing Netflix is still kind of, I don't want to say clueless, but still I don't think so. Their strategy in like, games at all, especially mobile games, is is that finished yet, or at least like have a specific direction that they're following. They're, I, I think they're just kind of let's try uh, like using our IPs in any way possible. Meaning we need people that will make games with our IPs, like let's say. I don't know, next games are like Riot currently is using their own IPs, but I'm guessing that maybe some games they will even like grant their own licenses there in some kind of form of cooperation. But still, uh, it seems like we're just throwing stuff on the wall and wait for which one of those will stick there. Yeah, their f- strategy is definitely not finished, but it's definitely more finish. Ooh, <laughs> <Badums. Nice. laughs> hey. but like the thing, the thing about Netflix is it's quite interesting because they have to do this gaming moves because they're really feeling the squeeze. They're up against like Amazon, HBO, yeah, Disney, Disney and they're, they're yep. bundling everything together. Like, and Apple, like Apple TV as well. Like they need to have more services because suddenly 
you know, Netflix is looking at the most expensive options because with Amazon like TV, you also get Amazon Prime. Like, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, and they also like increased the the subscription fee uh, recently as well. So, look, why not? Uh, why not to yeah, add? Because the growth well? is stalling. <laughs> Yeah, but, but one thing, like, I, I've tried to play a Netflix game because I have a Netflix subscription, but, like, I think they're kind of breaking rule number one because it's really hard to find a Netflix mobile game. Like, if you open the Netflix mobile app, there's no hyperlink to games. So, basically, you're supposed to go into the app store, download the game, put in the Netflix, like, login. I don't know my password for my Netflix login. You never use it. It's always on the TV. Yeah. It's really yep. hard to download a game compared to a normal game on the App Store. Like, it's, they're kind of going against the grain there. Yeah, it sounds like a blockchain a little bit, so it's, it's fine. Though. <laughs> People will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you don't need to put your wallet in, uh, then uh, you're fine. <laughs> Has anyone played any Netflix games? Nah, well, it's like all hyper-casual hyper um, stuff for now, right? So... If I get it right, that uh, Stranger Things games is not even on their account. Yeah, it's next and, and won't account. be because it's uh, you know in a. It's a free to play, like free real free to play. to play game. Yeah, yeah. Would be nice to to watch um, how they uh, transform this to like uh, f not free to play. Oh well, free to play, but without any monetization inside. <laughs> so what do we think? Do we think Netflix will be a force to be reckoned with in the gaming space, or do you think it's going to be a big fat nothing burger? Well, currently yeah. it sounds like big fat nothing burger if you <laughs> if you put it like that. But <laughs> let's see. I guess there's more and more people coming into Netflix. They have like lot of open position and pretty much scouting for gaming people. And I guess it's just a matter of time when somebody come up comes up like with a like valid strategy how to actually connect the whole Netflix thing with games. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh <clears throat> Let's move on. So Sky and Journeymaker, that game company, raised 160 mil. I think this was one of the biggest raises lately. Uh, if you remember those games, those are pretty much really, really artistic titles. Like that's definitely like some kind of a could be said like especially Journey. It's an artistic experience rather than like our usual bread and butter, mm -hmm. mobile free to play cash cow. So that's really interesting. Uh, one of the interesting bits in the article that there's Ed Catmull, uh, one of the co-founders of Pixar, which, yeah, because the games are so artistic, this makes so much more sense. But it's, uh, yeah, in, in the wake of all the like big acquisitions and all the mergers where there's all about money, uh, this is some kind of a nice... <laughs> Nice uh, exception to the crowd where I would say still games with artistic, like mainly based on artistic expression still has big value. Mm. So we'll see. Good for them. I mean, yeah. I haven't played it, but I've seen pictures and videos from the game. It's <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. Like, yeah, I might even start playing it. It looks actually yeah, quite I don't, good. I don't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think so? You won't, yeah, you won't start playing it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it on your face. Uh. <laughs> Is it that, are you tanned or you're blushing a little bit? Because no, I'm really, good. like, and dude, I'm a bit Tired. sick. I'm a bit sick, so I'm a bit warm, yeah. so it's, like, actually mm. a fever. <laughs> oh, fever, okay. Yeah. Amazing. Dancing yeah. fever? What? No, I think it's more. He's a real person, not an anime character. You cannot translate it into that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a cold. <laughs> All right. So, also, moving on to the next news, uh, Playtica is looking for a buyer to take over the company just one year after going public. Uh, basically, the mobile games designer said its, its board has initiated a process to evaluate its strategic alternatives, <laughs> including the sale of the company. So, Playtica went public at 11 billion valuation, but currently, it's being traded around 7.3 billion. And I guess Yikes. this kind of is just a bit of financial engineering they're looking to do, I guess. I would say Playtica, I think they even somewhere stated it that they are not really good at creating games rather than operating games, which mm -hmm. I think they're excellent at. And this, this is maybe one of the problems that the growth has stopped and usually their growth has been fueled by acquisitions mainly. 
not yeah. by creating their own yeah. titles like do you know models like yeah, I don't know, Supercell has where you just create like a bunch of games throughout the year and kill most of them and one of them one of them becomes a success. Playtica would usually just acquire different studios with the successes already in their hands. So can you, can you um, remember like any uh, any new game that was made by Playtica recently? No, they've been mm. living on Slotomania for so long. Like it's just number one and it's bigger than all the other. Pretty yeah, much they had Solitaire Harvest, combined. but it was uh, acquired. I think the, right. the latest acquisition was the <coughs> reworks, Redicore. Yeah, if okay. I remember correctly, for six hundred mil. Yeah, but a game made by the Playtica team. By internal studio. Yeah, internal studio yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, me neither. So it's just okay. So that's not yeah, only. I me. think I was checking earlier today. It's quite a clever move by them, actually, because like the market cap I checked this morning was about eight point one billion uh, after the news, but like looking because they're a profitable gaming company, they might actually get something like ten mil, ten billion for like the sale because you're then you're actually looking at the financials. So it actually could be quite a bit of, bit of clever financial engineering if they manage to pull it off. Hmm. Okay, and like then the question is like, who would buy them? <laughs> like they have really good tech, I would say, and all the like live op systems and pretty much the squeeze machine works there pretty well. So I would guess maybe they could be a target for someone that, that actually wants to enter into the mobile gaming industry and don't like don't have these means on the, their side. Yeah. I wouldn't even, I don't know, like EA is too, too, too low to buy them. Is do you want to, do you actually think EA want to move into social casino? Like it's kind of, you know, oh, nah, they, they don't, they no don't. way. No. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that was no a bad, way. bad tip. No way. Yeah. It's like, you know, it would be yeah, that, that's, PR. that's the thing that I forgot that like a lot, big parts of their portfolio are social casino, which is not that Majority. super popular to acquire. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but keep in mind that they have uh, other companies there, like like Vuga or uh, the Ridicore guys. Yeah, and then there's the, the Solitaire Harvest game. I'm not sure yep. what company was. Uh, lots of casual uh, games still on their portfolio, yeah. even outside the social casino genre. Yeah, so I was I was listening to to the game makers um, podcast recently about M and A's, and you know they. Um, Started talking about the Playtica deal as well. It's like most probably Uplawin would be one of the possible buyers. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, you know pretty pretty hard to say. Yeah, it would make sense. Have you ever done any UA for Social Casino? I hear it's like the most elbow out thing you can do UA for. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the creatives are well definitely way different from everything else. Uh, the CPIs are really high. I've done it for one game, which was like a long, long time ago in Soft Lounge, and the game was shit anyway, so... <laughs> I've heard <laughs> someone say like CPIs go to like 110 or something. Yeah, it's <laughs> easily, easily. Even even more. So I, I ran one RPG game, and the, the CPI in the US was 300, so... <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. It can be pretty, pretty high. And all the creatives with all the explosions of coins, the more the better. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Circus. Yeah, maybe one of the things to kind of consider is in, in this is that the whole genre is pretty much currently undergoing a transformation, mainly spearheaded by Coinmaster, where you would pretty much go into this, let's say, casual casino. And I don't think so. Playtica has currently an answer for that on their portfolio. Mm. So that could be also one, one of the things here in, in play. Yeah, and everybody yeah. say that um, the ATT and the whole IDFA situation affected them the most because of the social casino uh, portfolio. I guess like 90% true because of the, all the retargeting they are definitely doing because of the social casino. Uh, it's not like the, the, the usual UA you do for these type of games. You are definitely yeah. doing all the CRM stuff and, you know, VIP programs for all the whales. <laughs> <laughs> you have there yeah back in my retargeting days like always the biggest clients were on the gaming side were always like even spending more than some of the e-commerce people were always mm. the social casino like yeah and they're quite sophisticated as well when it comes to retargeting yeah yeah so that that makes much more sense to exit now and not wait until google follows suit through idfa stuff ah but that's gonna be uh, like two years two years easy Easy. But yeah, but the valuation in those two years were going to plummet even more. So yeah, why I wait now and sell? Well, you can't say that. It's you still a profitable can't. gaming company that yeah. you know prints billions every year. So, uh. yep. so 
Let's, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, well, let's try to to add one more news, which was uh, actually pretty hilarious. <laughs> 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 this the to be. Best one. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't think so. People were talking that much about this one, but for me, actually, this was really hilarious. So there's was this whole Pixelmon scandal or fiasco, I would say. <laughs> where it was one of those really really big NFT projects. I don't know if and if it was the biggest one as for like the no. initial sale of tokens. All I know is the first videos that they brought out looked amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, all in all, this was all built on the premise that there will be some kind of Pokemon like voxel based RPG open world game <laughs> where people could pre pre buy the nfts of course and the game raised something in the vicinity of 70 million if i understood correctly through through the sales of the nfts and they were doing this really really nice promotional video where literally it seems like jurassic park where you would have different dragons and pokemons and whatnot and you could battle through them uh, in the in the whole world it works really really nice gorgeous and like every, like they pretty much hired someone to do the video for them and then uh, later down the line, I guess a few months later, uh, they actually showed first batch of those uh, supposed to be Pixelmons, and they look <laughs> completely horrible. <laughs> like paint it was so graphics. funny. It was so funny. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. But they also like they also did this NFT drop with like a Dutch auction, which just adds so much more pressure. Where they start like at a higher level, like value, and then basically everything was sold out in two hours. They started, I think, around like four ETH per NFT and then it went down like gradually and then basically you could buy in they were all gone within two hours and then people got them a few days later and like the the tweets and the videos it's like oh it's beautiful yeah instant it's meme Instant it meme. turned basically into a meme fest. If I understood correctly, the memes themselves were then sold as an NFT collection <laughs> and they make even <laughs> some money also. That's so amazing. what do we think? Was this a scam or was it just really big incompetence? Like w which uh, one? Uh, as I read through the whole, like there was this kind of detective detective thread uh, posted on Twitter through one guy because, you know, it's on chain. So you can see yeah. some of the transactions and he pretty much tracked down how the money flowed there. And then they talked with the actual artist of those six dragons that they did for the video. And then they tracked down some of the assets, which were pretty much as Unity yeah, Asset Unity Store, Asset $150 Store, yeah. assets. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, come on, you, you raised 70 million and use assets for $150, really. Wow. That <laughs> outstanding move. <laughs> yeah, but, the, but he pretty much pointed out that the guy behind the project uh, was responsible for two failed Kickstarter projects that already uh, failed. Oh, okay. So this seems like, a, yeah, Seems like a continuation, just in bigger scale of that whole thing. If I understood that correctly, but of course the creators still well, promise that it will be all rainbows and unicorns, and they will make everything right. Yeah, but of course. Seems to me Let's that see. this is just turning into a glorified scam. But like they they, they pulled on all the heartstrings for people like our age, like Pixiemon, close to Pokemon and Digimon. Like yeah, you can have <laughs> these little creatures in a world, and it's gonna be great. But you can finally own them, like honestly. And then I saw him tweeting the guy. Uh, he was just like, "Yeah, we're gonna spend two million on fixing up the NFTs and make them look better." You're like, "Dude, just do <laughs> do right and do all over again. Like, there's no fixing these. They look horrible." <laughs> like, if I understood correctly, the game team that he or they, like the creators of this hired, they pretty much also want to kind of back out of this because, yeah, that's not really a good press. So, and and it seems to me that this whole thing was just, you know. No roadmap, no game design, no nothing, no assets, and bam, 70 million. What do we do now? That's it. So a bit of both, and a bit of incompetence, and a bit of scammy. Scamminess. Yeah. No, it's it's uh, not scam, it's rug pull. <laughs> and <laughs> this word rug pull. <laughs> so bad. Yeah. Uh, if it's a fraud, call it a fraud, that's it. No. Yeah. It's, a, it's a classic rug pull. What move. do you think happens to the money now? Is he just, you know, going on holiday or like what's going to happen? Uh, th this is this is the interesting part. Like, can you actually do something about nope. these things? I don't think you so. Can you can return it anything. Because you have the wallet. You can return it, but you lose all the, the gas fees. But why would you what return you them? You, 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 why your, would you yeah, return it's them? your money. <laughs> you have 70 <laughs> million on your account. Why do you want to part with them? Move to Bahamas immediately. 
and a sip your drink all Man, day the long. Swedish honestness is just coming out in me. I'm like, why would you do that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, you know, this is how, how we roll in Slovakia, so <laughs> we are used to it. We are used to it. Mm. Yeah, I think this this is like one of the main reasons why people like uh, Gabe Newell or Team Sweeney mm. are currently talking about the whole space being just riddled with scams and fraud, which just proves the point here. So mm. until we get rid of these things, eventually it will be just like that and the whole NFT public picture will look like like this pretty much like the kevin meme <laughs> that's actually a pretty good meme <laughs> but the sad thing is like this thing will encourage you know 10 more others because there'd be so many people that like they raised 70 million like in a like yeah, half year do doing well. this like i can do that as Give well Call it, yeah next mon whatever mon just add mon to end, end of anything and it's <laughs> money like, mon yeah money mon <laughs> scam mon <laughs> man oh, yeah. uh you is can you can do it uh, as well, Felix, because you are the admin <laughs> manager. There we go. Uh, I should have mm. my own NFT. Yep. <laughs> Jesus, sure. is it is it time to move on to the topic that we're dreading I think, the most? Yeah, I think we're so. gonna look I really think... stupid. Yeah, <laughs> because we're doing it because we want to prevent these things from happening. Yeah, <laughs> to actually educate people a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. <laughs> we didn't prepare anything in advance, so this is just uh, you know Remo asking questions. <laughs> Okay, so let's start. So uh, last time we were doing the same setup for UA. This time we're doing the same setup for game design. So uh, <laughs> the discussion will go as follows. I'll ask you questions. Felix and Matje will try to answer as best as they can. I love and it. Then we'll we'll try to answer. Not we will answer, but we'll try to answer. <laughs> I'll have you Very know. I've worked in the, I've worked we'll in the game industry we'll do for the multiple answers. years. I know everything. About game design. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So let's start. First question, how to start with game design? What do you mean how to start? So if, you, if, you, if you're like a person entering the industry or some kind of promising wannabe game designer, what would you do in order to start with game design? Surely you must start with like economics degree because I'm thinking like having a good understanding of macro and microeconomics is like the bedrock when it comes to mobile gaming. And then, you know, you get an internship at, you know, Blizzard. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I would say QA first as an entering uh, into the industry, into any, any gaming company. And then as soon as I understand how the games work, then um, I might try to just, uh, you know, fall in love with the game design as well. Because that's like f for some game designers a natural way from promoting from QA person uh, to game design afterwards, after some time of like uh, being in the industry, if you're like a very new person, or you just go and study uh, psychology and then uh, there you go. You can end, you can be hired by, uh, by Pixel Federation. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say there's a really, really big difference between the current mobile industry and premium industry, especially indie games, where pretty much with indie games, everybody can start right now uh, as, as they if they have like a passion for games or the games are their hobby if they love making games and they can start creating games the question is what to do if you actually want to make a living out of it because that needs to be said outright that making a living out of it and doing it as a hobby project are two really big different things yeah. uh, then going from the notion that premium and indie games are more focused on the actual experience and the gameplay itself and they are kind of and really specific because if you take some let's say some big games uh let's say assassin's creed or god of war mm -hmm. or like cyberpunk you have very 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 specific set of game designers or even level designers working on those games that would have completely different skill set as someone sitting behind clash of clans or clash okay. royale explain okay, the skill set quick please. question mm -hmm. sorry Felix. Yeah. quick question w what's the difference between level designer and game designer yeah, that's a yeah, that's a really good point. There's a really really big difference. Game designers create systems, mechanics, and gameplay. Level designers use the environment to communicate ideas. Ooh, wait. So wow. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> yeah. Sound. Yeah. Sound, so sounds sound like a bit of bullshit, which we don't <laughs> have on our podcast. Yeah, yeah. This is no <laughs> bullshit podcast. Don't don't forget about that. Yeah, let, 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 let me just give you an example. So level designer is someone 
that is creating content through some kind of system and structure of things that that somebody created for him uh, in order to create the environment for himself. So, you know, you're doing a level somewhere, so you put there traps, mobs, spawn points, whatever, puzzles, something that you can... And usually you start with an idea that, let's say, I want the player to solve this puzzle in this level. I want the player to fight this boss. So I need to create the environment in order to like pose a challenge for him or something like that. So, And then, in between, somebody created the combat system of that whole thing. Somebody created the HP scaling of the boss getting stronger. Well, you know, in the next level, your HP getting stronger when you leveled up and some, like, you know, the numbers part and whole mechanics part and how we interact with the environment, that's the work of a game designer. But level designer doesn't do these things, he just does the content and communicates the environment, like the ideas through the environment. So those are two two things, pretty much. So basically, if I'd say that to a real world example, I'm playing GTA V, and level designer mm -hmm. does the missions, and then basically the game designer does the combat, like shooting, like yes. shooting and how you hide behind the, the pillars and stuff like that. How you enter the car, how you exit the car, how much seconds it takes, you know, just to like, kick someone out of the car and mm -hmm. like that can, you know, falling damage, how much damage you will get if you fall from somewhere. Level designer is the, actually the one that builds the missions, the city, the quests, the, the content of itself. Okay, uh, so pretty much one, one builds the box and then the other one fills the box. Ooh, okay. Ooh, that, ooh, that was good. That was good. Perfect. And who who is more important for the for the let's say mobile game company? Yeah, yeah. For is mobile game mobile? company, you are not that dependent on level design that much. Usually, usually, but mm -hmm. some genres are are really are like stuff like I don't know Candy Crush for instance. Mm -hmm. It's or like the the recent Dream Games, uh, mm -hmm. Royal Match game. They have really really excellent level design there. They push it really uh, like up a notch there. So that game is definitely completely uh, depending on level design. Mm -hmm. But if you take games like Clash Royale, for instance, there's minimal level design. Level design is basically just the arenas that you change somehow or like do some stuff with it. But it's all about systems and the interaction between the units that you need to follow in order to beat the meta game. So what skill set do you need for like premium AAA games compared to mobile games? Uh, I usually used to say that <laughs> you need for mobile games you need to have the whole skill set of premium and indie game plus the whole analytics monetization ad stuff. Yeah, I would say I would say that as well because you know f with free to play you need to know the business side of things and you need to understand that that you are not making the game just for the the gamers that love playing games but you also want to make a living and you want to also like pay your bills and uh, you know make the <laughs> the company profitable as well. The the problem with the, the premium design is that you are only caring about that one single purchase, which is the business model. Yeah. So after that single purchase, sometimes even just hyping up the game works, of course. But in the end, you don't care if players even complete the game. Like If you look yeah. at these, I know that this will sound cruel, but in the end, mobile games have much better retention than actual premium games that you buy. Imagine how many people actually will play through this whole, you know, big journey of Witcher 3. And then yeah, compare it well, to retention Witcher, with Clash of Clans. But Witcher 3 is a bad example because it's a very boring game. <laughs> it's the best <laughs> RPG in <the> last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just didn't get But you get my point. Pretty yeah, much yeah. retention is better in mobile games. Like People play more Clash of Clans than they will ever play Witcher 3. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because I don't have my computer with me at all times, and I don't have my. Uh, you can you can buy a Steam Deck. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy Steam Deck and then play Witcher Three there. All right, we're distracting uh, Remo from asking us the questions. Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I would say a good answer would be get e either a conventional background, uh, like something that's close to game design, which should be something mathematically based, economically based. Psychology is also good, but I would say even programming is good. So you understand how the things works, lose the illusions and don't think that you can create everything immediately. Like that's like, I think re really one of the important steps when you're starting that you need to understand how things work and after that start building games, that, that's okay. So and what are they yeah, studying? The other, other like stepping what are they studying? Programming? Gold. Economics or no economics? Uh, economics is okay. I, I don't I don't see a problem with it. I think uh, Toko, like one of the main uh, dis um, game designers in Supercell, the one between Heyday, uh, behind Heyday and Brawl Stars, he has like uh, 
theoretical physics, if I understand correctly. Why didn't you say psychology? Theoretical psychology is okay also. You can do whatever then pretty much it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not, about liberal it's not whatever. It's, it's w- within all of these degrees, you understand systems. What kind of systems? You're all, like all how systems work. But Universally. Okay, universally, okay. Mr. Systems. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question, Rima. Next this question. Is, this is actually next a really question. good session because I'm learning a lot already. Uh, what is hard and challenging uh, about game design? Can everybody do it? Easy. Everybody already easy. does it. <laughs> easy, easy. Everything is easy. <laughs> Same thing as with the, with the UA. Like everybody thinks like, okay, so you know, if I put this in the game, it's going to increase the retention. If I put there, you know, we will make more money. Yeah, no. <laughs> Same thing with you, right? Like, yeah, okay, so, you know, you, you should start that campaign, you know, that uh, test that channel. Like, okay, thank you very much, but no, this is not how it works. So basically, I don't um, uh, I don't think everybody can do it. Um, and a lot of uh, people don't understand. If you change one thing, there is, a, you know, um, a net of other things that change with that one thing, which is in the, in the background, and that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's not visible for for a lot of people they don't understand that so yeah i don't think everybody can do it no H- how would you how would you convince someone that let's say your producer on your team that no it's not a good idea to pretty much do game design on your side and rather let's let the game designer do it the one with three years experience rather than zero years experience yeah that's the thing because uh even the producer is the owner of the of the project? PNL, yeah, of the PNL on the project, uh, obviously. So he, he, it should be in his or her uh, uh, interest to actually give you all the means, or not you, but all the ga- to the game designer to actually make uh, all the changes. Because the same thing with uh, with COVID. So everybody now is a you know a expert, expert in vi- <laughs> yeah expert in in COVID environment, virology, and whatever. But nobody knows shit about it. Yeah, well, that's that's how it is, and the same is <laughs> same with the game design. So you know, but it's not about the producer and game designer. It's all about like the ego of the producer. So you know, you need to have the communication skills actually as a game designer to be able to convince the producer. Like, okay, so you know, dude, this is my competence, and I know <laughs> what I'm doing because I've done it for three years already. How much experience do you have? I think this is one of those graphs that is really, really hard, hard suffering from the crooning Danner effect, where yeah. the less you know, the more kind of, the more you are sure you're doing the right thing, <laughs> and the more you know, the, the more you start doubt your decisions, yeah. and actually you enter this kind of critical mass after some time that okay, maybe I, I, I think I know now what I'm doing, but mm. from the first like surface level, it could seem like really easy, but it is not, and I think this is the, the biggest. Uh, difference between like a senior game designer and junior game designer that senior game designers think like 10 steps forward and junior game designers think two steps forward so that and these decisions can sometimes really destroy the project completely because you make one bad decision in the beginning and it just just drags you with you until you hit the day one retention wall do you have an example from your personal career when you did something like that uh when i didn't think that much from the beginning yeah uh i would say depends on some genres are easier than the others some some are more complicated i know especially when we were making the match three game that i would say yeah we should have done it a little bit differently because we were never in that position that we were actually running a match three game rather than building and building a match three game and running the match three game are two really different things where okay. you need to think about the ROAS and the revenue and like all those KPIs, then you don't really need to think when you are just building the stuff and well, trying to make. Do you think now you would be in a better position to build the match three game? Yes, than because like six I would. Ago? I would have shot down some of the features that we were considering or building along the way in a way that I would say they wouldn't have an impact on KPIs that we were targeting. Yeah, for. but you wouldn't because you know uh, you were working with very different people and those producers with all, all those egos. Yeah, well, <laughs> they would never listen to you. I know. Well, but it's I, hard. It's I, hard. It, it is. Hard. It is. Yeah. Well, everything yeah. is hard. Uh, what do you think are the main skills that define a game designer? 
set actionable skills code. that you can write into like CV or you know job requirements. Man, it's just experience, right? It sounds like the more you're talking, it's just like how much, how long you've been doing it, how many times you screwed up. That sounds like the number one thing for game designers, from what you're saying, at least to me. Well, I would say the communication skill right there, but it's uh, it's not the hard skill. <laughs> uh. Oof. Uh, one one of the usual suspects is of course the communication but the other one is to be able to pretty much communicate your design carefully which means writing specific documentation because yeah, one of the, the bigger problems is that Ugh. the the documentation needs to be clear enough even if you're not there and somebody is reading it they don't need you for for them yeah. to explain it that's that's the problem that usually game design documentation if it's done wrong you need the game designer then for you to explain what he's even talking about that's the problem so you need to make it so, idiot proof yeah to make it idiot proof because usually what happens that you write the documentation even after that you still get ping pong with the programmer if you omit some edge yeah, cases what's this, or if what's cases that? yeah okay and, and and you need to think about these edge cases already and just think like if i'm a programmer i'm programming it and if you didn't cover some of the edge cases, programmer cannot design the thing for you. They will try to make it work, of course, but then it means they're designing it and you're doing it wrong because you have, you had to thought about these before. Okay, but you won't write in the CV that okay, so I'm good in communication, I'm good in writing, and you know I'm the game designer. Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, what else? <laughs> yeah, what do you write like? thought of a new construct in a game yeah. that improved retention by 2% on day 7 or like problem solver <laughs> <laughs> other things would be yeah experience definitely counts well, I, I guess what most counts is shipped games with successful commercial results that's mm. that's the biggest one there's of course this kind of a problem that hiding in big teams can make it look oh, good on yeah, paper yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I worked like, with uh, five different gaming companies. Uh, we shipped 10 games with multi-million revenue and, you know, you were just there, like, uh, getting coffee for everyone. Yeah, yeah, and, and this this brings <laughs> me to my pretty much other question that if we are doing this whole, like, um, recruitment thing, I don't really that care much about the whole CV. I would rather care about the design test that you take when you What's are applying design somewhere. Test? What does it look like? What is it? Yeah, <laughs> it's a really, really specific test um, for game designers where you pretty much get an assignment that you need to do, like a homework or whatever you want to call it. And you have limited time for it. Usually goes from like, I don't know, a week or two weeks or three days, depends. And then after it, you submit it and people in the company that you're applying for review it. And then you have another round. Uh, there was some... Like really, really good lectures about this already that I've seen, especially on GDC. Uh, I think there was the game director from Ubisoft, he, which had this session. Then there was this other guy, don't remember what was his name, but he was pretty much even showing the actual assignments that he got. Uh, those are sometimes really, really long, but I think this is the best proof that people can, can work on, on what can you, you want for out? them Do to work. Do you have work. one handy? Uh, you, it, it's, for instance, it could be a deconstruction of a game and you, you need to really, really care, detailly word out what, what's behind your thinking. So like why, let's say this mechanic work, how, how these two games compare, for instance, and, and depending on, on your way of thought, then people will see how can you do approach this. Like even if you see the systems behind these games, if you see the structure, <laughs> On what they are Start with the on. systems already. I mean, it <laughs> said it's all about systems. systems like a million. I wish times. you had an assignment that you'd done that you could read out, and just so I know exactly what it sounds like. Like, well, I think uh, there is this question about the rock paper scissors. That's definitely yeah, we have an assignment. Yeah, that's definitely worry. from that assignment. <laughs> right. I, I remember uh, Rima talking about it, but obviously I didn't remember what's the solution for it. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. This this is like one of my favorites. Not the rock paper scissors. This next one, but let's talk about this one. So you get an, into this situation really, really often. Uh, your producer is pretty much saying, or founder, let's clone this game. What can go wrong? It is making so much money on the charts. We can make at least one third of that. I hear uh, this all the time. Yeah, of course. But it's uh, there's the fundamental problem of the producer who doesn't know how the game work or games work because the same thing with the Rail Match and the Toon Blast. I mean, look, 
So obviously the um, the Dream Games guys uh, they know exactly what's uh, what needs to be done on the back end and how the levels are or how the levels needs to be need to be structured and everything. So all the level design you mentioned. Uh, and this is something that you don't see from the charts. I mean, or from can, the surface level. Or from the surface, yeah. You can see how um, how the game looks like. What you you can assume what's in the game, uh, what kind of mechanics and everything, and how you know the visuals. But <laughs> everything that uh, that's uh, happening under um, at the ground, then uh, you, you can't see it. So then you start building the game, and suddenly you don't not even hit like the KPIs earn, <laughs> yeah you don't even earn like a third of what they earn you don't earn anything because the you know the game is dead <laughs> because you don't have the expertise Plus yeah, also you're fighting in like an uphill battle already because the game you're yes. cloning has been out for so much longer yeah. that basically will have better rankings in the Google and App Store so like it'll rank better and it get more organics yeah but, but people still do this like do you remember let's say 2016 how many Clash Royale clones came out that, that, that after that year yeah and you know still has there ever been still a, a clone that earned more money than the game they were cloning yeah only the hyper yes. casual right yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> hyper casuals works on this of course that's because that's more of a function of a marketing formula i would say yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. and creative formula but uh i think some of the games actually were better than the clones no well the ridicore right uh, it's um, not that they're direct clone but it's an iteration, I would say, rather. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think uh, what was it? Uh, uh, this is mo not a clone, but when we got into this really awkward situation where gardenscapes and homescapes, pretty much Playrix was copying the Matchington Mansion creatives, and they pretty much outspent them on UA. Yeah, that's true, but it's not cloning the game directly. So yeah, it's, it's cloning uh, the marketing strategy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. If, if player race copies you, then you know you're doing something right, you know? Yeah, exactly. They, o they only steal from the very best, period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but usually these games don't, like, clone... I, I, don't, I don't think so. There's, like, a really, really successful clones that, like, out outpaced or outspend the original. Usually it's done in a way that clones always make less than the original or so you are can see at par. The Candy Crush. Yeah, every, you can see it on every King. New like candy each, each crush. subsequent Candy yeah. Crush made less. Yeah, less money. So that's how it works. Yeah. Oh, this one's important. How ideas for new games are born. <laughs> Oof, that's a wild one. <laughs> but I would say, from my game designer perspective, no, uh, jokes aside. So um, a lot of people actually focus on uh, what's happening now and they're starting to produce the games that are trending at the moment and not a lot of people are just uh, looking ahead of things and try to assume what's going to happen in the future. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, that's how new games ideas are born. But I would say what needs to be done is a proper um, market analysis and then what kind of game combination or like genre combinations are are well not working the best but at least like trending upwards or you know uh, trying to see where the market is going to be in like one one year or two years and then uh, that's something that you should build but it's easier said than done of course it's very very hard to be done <laughs> yeah i'm assuming there's discussions around just like oh yeah i like this feature from this game and then i want to mix it with another feature and then basically you like combine something new and then like at the intersection of the things then basically that becomes a new game design uh, yeah that's one way of to do it. usually if we come from the worst to the best it's um uh, let's clone this game that yep. it's making a lot of money that's the worst yeah then second one is i like this mechanic let's build this game <laughs> when you don't even know from who you are building it because you just like building a game for yourself then, uh, as we are getting better, uh, let's build this new genre, even though we don't have any expertise in it. <laughs> That's still not that, that good. And then, uh, as we are getting better and better, it's let's do a market research first and see how the audience of this whole genre currently faring and where it's heading and what's the you know latest disruptors or like the, the genre defining games that were done there. Some, mm -hmm. um, like a good example would be, let's say, Coin Master. 
like if if you if you saw what Coin Master did, but actually what Coin Master did is also they took the mechanic from Pirate Kings, which I think was even sooner, and then just yeah. iterated on the spinning wheel and yep. turned it into slot machine, and then really took it off. But it was again an iteration on the whole casino genre where they wanted to bring in new audience through casualization of the social casino. So so that was like an excellent ideation thing. But yeah. it's more of a you need to have this kind of a market fit in, in mind that you're going afterward. Because then it will determine the mechanics and the whole feature set of the game because you base those on the audience that you are aiming for. And the audience is pretty much, you have this kind of a limit around the audience that it is expecting some kind of feature set. You cannot just throw, you know, RPG gachas at Housewives in Candy Crush. That, yeah, you know, it's not going to work. Won't be attractive for them. But... What can you do is, of course, you can throw renovation meta game around this destroyed villas and mansions mm. and ditch the whole saga map. And actually, we're back at Gardenscapes. <laughs> because Gardenscapes also is a great example of iteration of the whole genre. Because before, uh, there's this like excellent article done on by Adam Telfer on how Gardenscape pretty much morphed from hidden object game into match three game, mm. reinventing the whole thing in yeah. the process and pretty much turning this into this narrative meta game because they kept some of the features from the hidden object uh, game and then ditch it because they know that the hidden object game core gameplay is much more content demanding because you need to create so much stuff there than the match three game, which you don't. So actually mm. it's economically a much better solution. So th this is like an excellent iteration on market and product fit. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have like a couple, sub, uh, we have a couple minutes more left questions. Here. Yeah, that's even like nine minutes. Yeah, left. let's let's move on. Let's do the rock paper scissors. No, yeah, let's let no. Come on, no, no, rock no, paper no. scissors. Come on. Okay, okay. okay. We still want to look stupid, Manche. <laughs> I just wanted okay. to you know like uh, uh, actually share something useful for uh, for the audience as well. You know like. What's the the best um, effect you've seen on the day one retention? Uh, mm -hmm. Let's ask that now. No, if we have time left, we can do the the questions. Yeah, let's let's do right. like uh, AMA, and then uh, we can uh, we can leave the rock paper scissors for the, you know part two because I don't definitely want to have like UA part two as well. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> so yeah, what was the the most um, well like uh, the biggest effect you've seen on day one retention? Uh, with any game features, you know, you put in the game. So you have, you are in the soft lounge, you have a game, and then you put, I don't know, like a spinning wheel, and you saw 10% uplift on day one retention. Most probably uh, you not, don't. but yeah, but you know, what yeah, would be day the, one retention? The day one retention is a reflection of your core gameplay, meaning that if your core gameplay works, it's actually enjoyable to play the core gameplay, meaning that really smallest granular part of your game that people kind of repeat mm -hmm. uh, throughout playing your game, that's could be like matching candies or you know finding stuff in the hidden object game or i don't know fighting battles in fk arena or Raid shadow legends mm -hmm. like the core gameplay itself and if you change that it should have a really big impact on uh the actual day day one but it means that it's the core of the game so yeah. changing it is really hard to begin with <laughs> <laughs> and if you change that then it's gonna be it's gonna have an effect on other kpis as well right yes of course okay what about you, you you always need to start with this day one retention gate, which is just a reflection of core gameplay. If you just cannot pass that, it doesn't matter what comes afterwards. Okay. If you can put whatever you want on the top of it, it won't work because the, the core is, is shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But what's the most you can lift like day one retention by like having a good core? Like if you've already made the game, like if it's so far away from day one, like retention KPIs, like how much can you actually increase it by? normally um you need to be radical in your iteration that's like one of the things that i would always go for because doing just small changes usually doesn't you know move anything mm -hmm. uh depends also how 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 the game went out from production in terms of polish and like overall quality because sometimes games came out that you know just fixing it and making sure there's no bugs and like it's ux wise pretty good you can lift it pretty high Sometimes when you come out with something that's just there and you do three, four iteration, nothing happens. It's just it. That that's it. Uh, 
because some core, some core gameplay works better than the others for different mm -hmm. audiences, of course. <laughs> the tricky thing is nobody knows which one will work. Yeah. Otherwise, we would not be sitting here <laughs> debating this and we would be all millionaires. <laughs> well, I'll speak for yourself. I'm already a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway you yeah. know it, it, it's more of a like this is the first gate that actually like a free-to-play mobile team hits measuring mm -hmm. their day one retention and that's usually when the fun stops and everybody needs to realize what to do now in order to make it better or you know you can be popping champagne because you have i don't know 70 percent day one retention like idle minor tycoon vibes perfect <laughs> yeah and then sell the company to ubisoft and then Bye. Yes. <laughs> After their notes. Okay. There is also like one one um, really crucial question that everybody asks: like, when should we kill a game, and when to move on? Because it's again really important question, but they're definitely not. That's not an easy end to be answered anyway. Right. So what's the where is the point when we should just move on and uh, you know. Uh, if you game. feel your feature set is complete, uh, especially in a way that, let's say, up till day seven, that you have enough content for people to play until day seven, and you are kind of comfortable with your current feature set and say, like, yeah, this is the game that I want to have, and it's still not producing enough results, change it a few times. Mm -hmm. A few times meaning, like, three to six months. Mm -hmm because changing it takes a lot of time, implementing it, testing yep. it, you know, new tutorial, whatever. Uh, and then I would say after six months, if you were not able to, pro because usually what happens that people produce incremental increases. So retention goes from, I don't know, 30 to 35 to 38 mm -hmm. to 42. And sometimes you, you have these like nice bumps along the way, which means you're going the right direction. Sometimes these bumps go downwards, sometimes these go upwards. That's why you're testing it and you revert back if you screw something up in the process. But yeah. overall, if you don't see any uh, meaningful change within those three to six months, I think that that's it then. Yeah, that's what I that's what I also um, say uh, when we're talking about like killing a game in soft launch. So as soon as you can't see any meaningful improvement on the game in like three months, or let's say, okay, not three months, but from three to six months and you are still like on the same basically same kpis and you don't have anything else to add into the games like okay i think this is it let's <laughs> let's move to the to producing some some other games and i think uh we can uh we can uh, like end this uh session with one last question what's the difference between a good game designer and a shitty one <laughs> 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 you you're the one to to spot to answer. Really? Okay. So um, I think you are the shitty one, and we are the good ones. <laughs> that's how it that's yeah, how so it works. Arrogance is the key to being a good game designer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and ego, ego as yeah. well. Ego yeah, I think well. that that that's 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 like the currently the biggest downfall of a game design, like being kind of um, not being able to convince others through normal arguments and even get down on their level of game design knowledge to pretty much convince them because even like that's the arrogant part where you don't yeah. want to get down to their level of understanding and pretty much oh you don't understand this because yeah. i see 10 steps ahead but that's the problem that in order to convince your producer you need to get on the same level that his game design knowledge is which of course is not that good as yours supposedly that you're doing this some friday already yeah. and you need to communicate it clearly and pretty much yeah in home matter tell him that if we do this and that we'll probably won't far that far mm -hmm. and like the whole thing will be pretty much dead in some some time so as i said like these are these really really small decisions during the whole production phase that can screw up the whole project and it's on the responsibility of game designers to keep it in that straight line heading for that you know Mm -hmm. desired outcome that we're getting out of soft lunch we're getting into global lunch and everything works because if you if you let for instance let's let the steam stray away or lose focus you again somewhere there that, that you w yeah. weren't supposed to go could you say it in three bullet points like three things that make a good game designer and three things that make a bad game designer yeah you see you see a lot of steps ahead uh, you can clearly understand the consequ consequences of implementing specific game mechanics mm -hmm. You don't implement them because you like them. You implement them because they add value to your product. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I, this is my personal favorite. 
you have clear understanding of the current market trends. This mm -hmm. is really important because being able to pinpoint reference games makes stuff so much easier. Yeah. But if you don't know those reference games, you cannot pinpoint them because nobody will tell you that these games solved that same issue already two years ago. Yeah. Nice. Well, perfect. I think uh, I think that's it for uh, for today's sessions. Uh, not sessions, but sessions. Rock paper scissors next. <laughs> Rock paper paper scissors next. We can start uh, with that next week. <laughs> okay. Okay. We can we can do that. Uh, Who cares? Uh, <laughs> let's see. 